My name is Dr. Jason Rogers, and I'm a professor of cardiovascular medicine and an interventional cardiologist at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, California. The title of my presentation is Transcatheter Annuloplasty for Functional Mitral Regurgitation. Here are my disclosures. There's been significant interest in developing transcatheter mitral annuloplasty techniques since functional mitral regurgitation is prevalent and increases mortality in patients with systolic heart failure. You can see the significant prevalence numbers on this slide and the fact that in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy post myocardial infarction have up to a 59% prevalence of functional MR. The curves shown on this slide illustrate that patients with severe functional mitral regurgitation, shown with the red line, have higher rates of heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality than those with either mild to moderate or no functional mitral regurgitation. So unquestionably, this is an important clinical subset of patients and functional mitral regurgitation is bad. Now, in developing transcatheter annuloplasty technologies, we have to be aware that the mitral valve exists as an apparatus, and there are numerous contributing elements to mitral valve function shown here. And transcatheter annuloplasty targets annular dilatation, which is only one aspect of functional MR, but can be highly effective in properly selected patients, as we see from the surgical experience. The mitral annulus normally is saddle-shaped with the highest points being anterior and posterior, but becomes more planar with heart failure and annular dilatation. And this makes transcatheter techniques perhaps a little easier uh, to anchor on a flat annulus as opposed to a saddle-shaped annulus. One of the main challenges for transcatheter annuloplasty has been the significant variability in the annular size and dimensions. You can see here the normal anterior, posterior, and commissure to commissure dimensions and the variability in the normal mitral valve area. Additionally, there are several important structures next to the mitral annulus which cannot be injured during transcatheter annuloplasty, and these are significantly the left circumflex, uh, which is really most intimate uh, around the region of the left atrial appendage and anterior trigone, and also the coronary sinus, which uh, runs posteriorly along the mitral annulus. From an interventionalist standpoint, we live in a world of fluoroscopy and echo, and I thought that this image nicely shows the fluoroscopic relationships of the various mitral uh, elements. So we see in this patient, there's a mitral annuloplasty ring denoted by MA. Uh, below is the actual coaptation uh, zone of the leaflets with a mitral clip on it. More atrial, there's the coronary sinus and there's a coronary sinus lead here. And then the atrium is uh, uh, shown here and the ventricle is, of course, below the mitral apparatus. So fluoroscopically, uh, we have different planes of visualization for the different mitral structures, and this is important as we develop these therapies. So functional MR has two main uh, descriptive uh, categories. The first is the Carpentier type 1 which is a patient with normal leaflet motion and position. And this may re represent someone with uh, perforation in the leaflet, but in terms of functional MR is generally patients with non-ischemic or symmetrically dilated ventricles and annular dilatation. And the other main component is the type 3B, which is the ischemic cardiomyopathy, where there may be a regional infarct causing asymmetric papillary muscle displacement. And I think these two types are nicely shown in these diagrams. On the left, we have an example of symmetric papillary muscle displacement. Again, this is most common in 
non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but can be seen in three-vessel coronary disease with global cardiomyopathy and there's symmetric papillary muscle displacement and a central jet of mitral regurgitation. On the right, we have a patient with eccentric mitral regurgitation from a regional infarct here in the posterior wall, uh, resulting in more tethering of the posterior leaflet and an eccentric uh, posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation jet. The uh, diagrams down here show the brown dots being representative of the papillary muscles that uh, are symmetrically displaced on the left and asymmetrically displaced on the right. There's also another category of functional mitral regurgitation which is receiving increasing attention which is the so-called atrial functional mitral regurgitation most commonly seen in patients with permanent uh, or persistent atrial fibrillation and here you have patients with relative uh, left atrial enlargement and fairly preserved left ventricular size and function. And this results in a annular dilatation with predominantly central mitral regurgitation. Now the first surgical annuloplasty was described in 1955 by Davila et al. as shown here. And this was a uh, basically a suture annuloplasty circumferentially applied to the mitral valve for correction of mitral insufficiency. The basic mechanism of surgical or transcatheter annuloplasty would be shown here. On the top, we have an example of a patient with uh, annual dilatation and very little, if any, coaptation length or zone of coaptation between the anterior and posterior leaflets. Now, as we reduce this diameter in the anterior posterior from 40 to 28, uh, we can achieve a coaptation length theoretically of 6 millimeters. And the formula for this would be that the achieved coaptation length would be the amount of AP annular reduction in millimeters divided by 2. So this diagram shows the application of annuloplasty to a patient with symmetric mitral regurgitation uh, on the left before and on the right after. An annuloplasty, annuloplasty reverses the annular dilatation and restores the zone of coaptation, very importantly in this patient. Now there have been many, many types of surgical rings developed uh, over the last several decades. Uh, by different companies, different surgeons, many of them named after the surgeons that developed them. And this is shown in this uh, list here. But basically we think of rings uh, uh, in a couple categories. We think of them as either complete or incomplete, being either circumferential or open. We think of them in terms of their rigidity, whether they're flexible, uh, band, or semi-rigid versus rigid. And then finally, whether they're planar or have a more complex saddle shape, or in the case of this ring here, um, a very aggressive posterior uh, saddle shape. Now, which ring is best? Well, there have been no large randomized clinical trials looking at this. There's certainly many small case series and cohorts. Uh, many surgeons have a particular preference for a band that they're comfortable with. But some themes have developed over uh, the series of publications. And in general, it appears that a complete and also a rigid ring results in lower recurrent MR and heart failure recurrence and better left ventricular remodeling over time. So this is at least the surgical experience to date. And that restrictive annual plasty for functional mitral regurgitation uh, can be achieved by using a rigid or semi-rigid complete ring, undersized, one to two sizes, uh, smaller than the measured inner trigonal length. And there are sizing um, uh, rings and uh, templates that are used intraoperatively for this. Now, of course, we have to adapt this all to the percutaneous uh, arena, and, and a lot of these sizing algorithms will need to be redeveloped and relearned. Uh, we do know that annuloplasty does not work in everybody, and there are numerous echocardiographic parameters uh, 
that predict a less optimal response to annuloplasty, and that's shown here. But in general, patients with larger ventricles, more leaflet tethering, uh, more um, annular dilation may have less response to annuloplasty because the ventricle is just too far gone. And these might be some examples here of failure of annuloplasty or less effective annuloplasty. You can see in A and B, uh, panels A here on the left and B, these are patients with extreme symmetric and asymmetric papillary muscle displacement where you simply cannot overcome that degree of tethering with an annuloplasty ring. C shows patients with a uh, cleft and these often leak and surgeons uh, I'm told often will close a cleft at the time of annuloplasty, maybe up to five to 10% of the time. And of course D is showing that annuloplasty alone does not correct primary mitral regurgitation, but is, is rather adjunctive to a leaflet repair approach. So moving on to percutaneous annuloplasty, there are two main categories. There is direct annuloplasty, and this is really mimicking surgical annuloplasty, where you attach a ring or band directly to the mitral annulus. The challenges here are it's definitely more complicated and imaging intensive since you have to precisely place these anchors in the mitral annulus on a moving heart. But there are several technologies here we'll talk about. Indirect annuloplasty uh, works by modifying the shape of an adjacent structure, such as the coronary sinus, to improve co-optation. And the advantage here is that it's perhaps less technically complicated. Simply put the device in the coronary sinus and uh, cinch it. Uh, the disadvantages are that the coronary sinus and the mitral annulus are not exactly coplanar. They're often up to a centimeter apart. And by moving the coronary sinus, you don't always change the shape of mitral annulus in a one-to-one -one manner. But there are several technologies in this space. So in the category of direct annuloplasty, the device with the most uh, experience uh, worldwide and is CE marked is the CardioBand uh, device. And this is a flexible polyester sleeve uh, through which several uh, anchors are placed, uh, up to 12 or 17 helical uh, anchors at 8 millimeter increments. Uh, and this is deployed trigone to trigone. So this is a flexible band and is not a complete ring. So this animation shows the concept. This is transeptal transfemoral approach done under transesophageal echocardiographic guidance. And the initial anchors are placed at the anterior trigone. And then under echo guidance, a series of other anchors are placed. And then the entire system can be tensioned with a spool to reduce the mitral annular uh, diameter and circumference and uh, eliminate functional mitral regurgitation. And this device has been used extensively, and this paper in the European Society of Cardiology, European Heart Journal, shows one-year outcomes from transcatheter mitral valve repair using the CardioBand system. And you can see that in properly selected patients, uh, there can be a quite acceptable reduction in mitral regurgitation over time. And of course, the advantage being that this is a transcatheter approach and avoids surgery. Another device uh, currently under development is Millipede, and there's some early clinical experience with this. This is a complete semi-rigid ring with eight anchors. It has an adjustable size. It's fully repositionable and retrievable up until final deployment. And uniquely, it has an integrated uh, ICE or intracardiac echocardiography catheter that's uh, part of the delivery system that allows the operator to see each anchor being um, placed individually. So here's a video showing the device uh, that can be opened. And the blue catheter uh, in the middle is the ice catheter. And this allows each anchor to be individually imaged without any shadowing from, from within uh, and placed very precisely into the mitral annulus.
Each anchor can be moved uh, to an optimal position, and then the device is cinched, as shown here, uh, can be cinched regionally to a customizable shape. And if acceptable at this point, the device is released. Now, it could be removed at this point, but in this animation, it's being released. And here it stays in place, um, reducing the mitral annular circumference. So this device has been used uh, in humans, and you can see on the top uh, chart that there's an average reduction of the septal lateral dimension of 31% here in a, a series of seven patients. And uh, mitral regurgitation grade also uh, was reduced from three to four plus at baseline to either zero or one plus at 30 days. The third device that is direct annuloplasty is the AMEND system. And now this is a little different approach. This is a transapical delivery, uh, but the device is quite interesting. It can uh, reform through the catheter into a rigid D-shaped uh, complete ring, and then has a series of anchors that can be uh, extruded from the device to allow initial posterior anchoring as shown in panel B. And then the device is pulled forward to the anterior annulus in C and then fully anchored. And so they have reported a first in human case. Now in the category of indirect annuloplasty, the device with the most experience is the Carillon device. And this device is delivered through an internal jugular venous approach into the coronary sinus. Uh, it's a very simple procedure. It doesn't require very much time and there's minimal imaging requirements. There's a distal anchor and a proximal anchor, and the mechanism is shown in this animation here, where the distal anchor is placed, followed by the proximal anchor, and then the entire system is tensioned to reduce the posterior annular circumference and reduce functional mitral regurgitation. Now this was studied in a randomized sham controlled study uh, called the REDUCE FMR trial. And in this case, this was a double blind uh, study in 120 patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction and functional mitral regurgitation, uh, looking at mitral regurgitant volume, left ventricular and diastolic volume and end systolic volume. And what they were able to show is that the uh, Carillon device could statistically significantly reduce the regurgitant volume uh, over the control sham group. Uh, and you can see here on the right that the functional status of the patients also improved over time too. So there is a pivotal trial underway randomizing uh, patients with the Carillon device to uh, either active treatment arm or medical therapy group. Here are some other transcatheter approaches which have been reported. Uh, on the left, we have the ARTO device, which is a uh, device that has two anchors, one in the coronary sinus and one on the septum, and they're connected by a suture bridge, which can be tensioned and thus reduce the mitral AP diameter. In the middle, we have the mitral cerclage device, which actually um, goes into the coronary sinus and then exits uh, anteriorly uh, through the right ventricle and you can form a complete uh, loop around the mitral annulus and it can be tensioned. Um, there is concern for coronary artery uh, compression, but there is a small device that protects the coronary artery from being compressed. And finally on the right is a subannular approach. This is uh, the AccuCinch device, which is developed through, uh, which is delivered through the aorta retrograde under the uh, posterior mitral leaflet and kind of the posterior wall. And this uh, initially was developed for functional MR, but the focus now of this company and therapy is really uh, left ventricular volume reduction in patients with systolic heart failure, and they've had some uh, very promising early results. So finally, we would say that mitral valve uh, regurgitation and functional regurgitation is complex, and although transcatheter annuloplasty is promising, uh, there's certainly going to be a role for combination therapy. And all of the devices I showed you here uh, have been used concomitantly with uh, other 
treatment options such as MitroClip. So we see here um, annual plasty combined with MitroClip and a variety of uh, annual plasty technologies. So you know, perhaps the algorithm would be a uh, patient gets either annual plasty or MitroClip initially. And then if there's recurrent MR over time, patient could have an additional transcatheter uh, technology applied in a sequential manner. Or in, in select patients, you know, you may actually do both at the same time. So I think this is going to be an exciting area for uh, discovery as we move forward. So I hope I gave you a sense of the current state of affairs with transcatheter annual plasty. Um, here's my information and email. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Appreciate your attention. Mm -hmm.